Hello and welcome to this edition of Back in History. In this edition, we bring to you the graphic story of the trial and execution of Ken Sarawiwa at a time that General Sane Abacha was Nigeria's military head of state. It was a trial that caught the attention of the international community with several world leaders calling on Sane Abacha not to carry out the execution of Ken Sarawiwa and eight of his brothers, but just by a twinkle of an eye, Ken Sarawiwa and his eight Ugoni brothers were executed at the federal prisons in Portacot River State, Nigeria, on the orders of the military, and their bodies disposed of in an unmarked grave. It was one of Nigeria's worst moments in the eyes of the world. It was tragic, it was horrific, it was unacceptable to many, but to some, it was justice in return for the action of the persons that stood trial and became executed. We consider it important to give a detailed background to the events that resulted in the trial and execution of Ken Sarawiwa and his Ogoni brothers. Here is the background to the story. Ken Sarawiwa was from a place known as Ogoni. Ogoni is also known as Ogoni land. Ogoni or Ogoni land is made up of four local government areas, namely Eleme, Gokana, Kana, and Tai. It is the whole of this area that is jointly known as Ogoni or Ogoni land. As documented by Wikipedia, Ogoni has an estimated population of 2 million people. Ogoni is in River State and not far away from Port Harcourt. Its people are traditionally engaged in small-scale agriculture as they are blessed with arable lands freely given to them by nature. They are also engaged in fishing. For several hundreds of years, the people of this area lived together in kindreds and went about their day-to-day -day activities peacefully and harmoniously and without much national or international attention. This was the case for several years. In 1958, two years before the grant of independence to Nigeria, oil was discovered in Ogoni by Shell Petroleum. When the scientific analysis was carried out, it was discovered that the oil deposit in Ogoni was so much in quantity and that the oil quality was about the best in Africa. In essence, oil was discovered in commercial quantity in Ogoni land in 1958. From this moment on, the story of Ogoni was to change and change forever. There was jubilation from the indigenous of Ogoni that for the first time in their history, their community will find a place in the global map of unquantifiable wealth and that the wealth so discovered will change their fortunes collectively and individually forever. Equipment were moved into Ogoni. Expatriates came in in good number. Drilling was carried out in several places within Ogoni and in just a matter of time Ogoni became a hub for commercial oil production in Nigeria. Shell operated a total of nine massive oil fields, 96 wells, and five flow stations spread across the area. Several years into the exploitation of crude from Ogoni, the people of Ogoni began to take stock of what they had indeed benefited from the massive oil wealth taken from their land on a daily basis. They came to the conclusion that there was so little to show for the petrol dollars taken from Ogoni by Shell in partnership with the federal government of Nigeria. They drew the conclusion that so much had been taken from Ogoni, but so little was given to Ogoni in appreciation. They noted that their farmlands had suffered pollution of unimaginable proportion and serious environmental degradation, that their fishermen no more have any source of livelihood because the fishes and fauna in their streams and higher water bodies have been destroyed as a result of oil spillage. They noted that their primary schools and secondary schools are in the worst of forms and in some places dilapidated despite the wealth taken from Ogoni. They observed that their youth population is largely unemployed. They complained that their people live in poverty in the midst of plenty. That it was indeed an irony that money taken from Ogoni is shared to all the local government areas in Nigeria on a monthly basis as federal allocation and yet Ogoni, the goose that lays the golden egg, is not given a better proportion 
of their location in appreciation of its contribution to Nigeria. This state of affairs was no more acceptable to the people of Ogoni. They began to gather and discuss the way forward. They held meetings in hamlets within Ogoni and in some places in Port Harcourt. They raised awareness and called for a change of attitude towards Ogoni. They garnered the support of Ogoni sons and daughters in Nigeria and in the diaspora. Eventually, the people of Ogoni came up with a platform to assist in the further runs of the agitation. The said platform was known as MOSO, an acronym for, quote, Movement for the Survival of the Ogoni People. This group became the most visible social cultural movement of the Ogoni people. Its mission was clear to fight for the survival of Ogoni, a land whose people were denied of the milk that flowed from their land. The target of this struggle was Shell Petroleum and the federal government of Nigeria. For Mosop, these were the real enemies of Ogoni. Several persons were recruited into the movement and in no time it gathered so much momentum that it was never seen as a push of a movement. Ken Sarawiwa was nominated as the spokesperson of the movement. Ken was a journalist, novelist, playwright, TV and radio presenter of many years standing. He was a well-known public figure in Nigeria. Ken employed his rhetorical and journalistic skills to protect the Ogoni cause to several quarters in Nigeria. He did so under the umbrella of Mosso. Mosop worked stronger and attracted the best of Ogoni sons and daughters to its fold. In no time, it came up with a document called, quote, Ogoni Bill of Rights. This was an innovative step by the founding fathers of Mosop. In this Bill of Rights, Mosop made requests that were intended to better the lots of the people of Ogoni. Ken Sarawiwa and Mosop pushed the bill so far and gave it the widest possible publicity. Ken had made friends with some military officers in Portacourt during the Nigeria Biafra Civil War that lasted from 1967 to 1970. Most of these young officers later grew in ranks and became senior officers at the time of the emergence of the Ogoni Bill of Rights. Ken had also been appointed by the military as a member of MAMSA, which was a mass mobilization outfit set up by the military under President Ibrahim. Badamasi Babangida. Ken thus leveraged on this relationship with the military and sought audience with them to enable Mosso present the Ogoni Bill of Rights to the military. At that time, General Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida was the military head of state of Nigeria and General Sane Abacha was his right hand man. Abacha was the chief of staff and chairman joint committee of chiefs of staff. Babangida and Abacha were the most powerful persons in Nigeria at the time. Ken succeeded in securing a meeting with the military, and in October 1990, the Ogoni Bill of Rights was officially presented to the head of state, General Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida. The Ogoni Bill of Rights was presented to the military by the first president of Mosul, Mr. Garrick Leton, one of the highly respected elders of Ogoni land with Ken Sarawiwa and the rest in attendance. The president of Mosob used the opportunity to express the suffering and marginalization of the Goni people to the military. He then called for intervention. The struggle continued and in January 1993, General Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida, in his bid to address the issues of Ogoni land and of the larger Niger Delta region as a whole, decided to establish a body known as OMPADEC, that is, Oil and Mineral Producing Areas Development Corporation. In response to Babangida's good gesture, Mosob led a delegation to Abuja to thank the government and to further press their demands for Ogoni to be treated as a special case and as a special area. Mosob representatives were well received by Babangida's government. The secretary to the government of the federation at the time, Alaji Aliyu Mohammed, was in attendance at the meeting. 
The National Security Advisor, General A. Ali, was in attendance together with the Director of the Nigerian Intelligence Agency, NIA. By even having the military government to sit down with them for a meeting, Mosso had indeed gotten an unbelievable breakthrough. There was light in the tunnel, and things were beginning to look promising. The much-needed attention for Ogoni had been secured. It was then up for Mosso to manage this opportunity well, or bungle it. At the end of the meeting, the military government requested that Mossop should produce a list of all unemployed Ogoni youths. They also requested that Mossop should provide a detailed summary of how the oil companies were dealing with their host communities in other parts of the world. In essence, governments needed a template to know how oil companies abroad treat their host communities. The military government asked them to read up in the libraries and make reports to them, but Mossop insisted that someone needed to be sent abroad to be able to see firsthand how the host communities are treated there. Ken Sarawiwa was selected as the most appropriate person to go abroad. At this time, Ken's passport had been impounded by security agents long before the meeting. Mosob used the opportunity to insist that the passport should be released to Ken to enable him to travel abroad and bring back the needed information. One of the leaders of Mosul, who was at the meeting by name Chief Edward Kobani, in his interview with the Sentinel magazine, published on 6 June 1994, had this to say about what took place. We wanted to use this opportunity to get Ken's passport released. Following our insistence, they agreed, and right there, Brigadier General Akilu Director of Military Intelligence rang to get Ken's passport released. The passport was immediately released. Ken then traveled. End of quote. For Mosop, so much progress had indeed been made. They were lucky to have the ears of a military regime. Obviously, the military was concerned about the plight of the Ogonis and were eager to do something for them. Mosob had expected that Ken will bring back the needed information to enable the military to work on their demand. Surprisingly, when Ken Sarawiwa traveled abroad, he deviated from the mission for which he was sent. Chief Kobani, in the same interview, narrated thus again, quote, Rather than get the documents and come back, Ken went and addressed international bodies, granted interviews to CNN, where he now took positions which we in the steering committee did not mandate him to do. He told the whole world that Ugoni people were boycotting the upcoming general election. End of quote. This is how the progress made by Mosop crashed to the ground. The soldiers were angry and their determination to compensate Ugoni with a roadmap for development was suspended. Things began to go wrong from that moment, and the leadership of Mosul became divided. Ken enjoyed his international mention and lambasted the government of Nigeria and of River State at every opportunity he had. He also called out Shell Petroleum. For him, the Ogoni struggle needed sustained confrontation. He employed the international media as much as possible. He reported Shell Petroleum and the federal government of Nigeria to the world. Gory pictures of Ogoni flooded the international space. Ken had indeed succeeded in raising awareness to the international community, but his action frustrated the sympathy that Babangida's government began to develop for Ogoni. Several founders of Mosub and elders of Ogoni were not happy with Ken. Ken was not ready to back down. He began to take over Mosob and issued directives as the new man at the helm of a face. He recruited youths and many others into Mosob and sounded his ideas clearly to them. He told the youths repeatedly about his international connections and how he has placed Ogoni on the global map for the first time. Ken sought the formation of affiliate bodies of Mosob. 
the affiliate bodies were eight in number, namely National Youth Council of Ogoni People, Federation of Ogoni Women's Association, Conference of Ogoni Traditional Rulers, Council of Ogoni Churches, Ogoni Teachers Union, National Union of Ogoni Students, Ogoni Central Union, and Council of Ogoni Professionals, COP. This compartmentalization of Mosul was seen by some elders and founding members as a calculated attempt by Ken and his acolytes to sideline the elders within the organization. There was bad blood in the house of Mosul. Some elders accused Ken of having hijacked Mosul to himself. Others accused him of having militarized Mosul through the youth wing. Most elders and founding members then withdrew their membership and stated, that Ken's approach to the Ogoni struggle was unacceptable to them and that such approach will eventually prove unproductive. Ken was accused of personalizing the Ogoni struggle. Indeed, all was not well with the House of Mosul. It became a house sharply and obviously divided against itself. On his part, Ken Sarawiwa was unhappy with the elders. He accused them of working against the interests of Ogoniland. The youths that were with Ken also held the same view. For this reason, every meeting of the elders was suspected as being a meeting against Ogoni. It was always alleged that the elders attended such meetings to share money, money given to them by Shell and the federal government of Nigeria, to thwart the interest of Mosop and of Ogoni. This suspicious atmosphere persisted and eventually became toxic. There was disaster waiting to occur and it was just a matter of time. Following the tensed atmosphere in Ogoni, the police were drafted in to study the situation and make a recommendation to government. In April 1994, the then Assistant Commissioner of Police in charge of operations in River State by name SCP J. Atawodi sent a telex to the police headquarters and stated in part as follows, quote, law and order has indeed broken down in part of Ogoni and it is time for governments to assert authority to ensure safety and security of individuals. This trend is equal to the unwholesome activities of some disgruntled members of the area who inadvertently usurped government powers and took the laws into their hands. End of quote. The military government of River State was also given a copy of the report. Following this report, the government then set up a security outfit for Ogoni with the name Internal Security Task Force. Soldiers were then deployed to Ogoni under the command of a colonel who was of the same rank with the military government. While there in Ogoni, the soldiers did their best to maintain peace and order. But the situation was still bad. The irate youth began to demand for compensation from Shell Petroleum and also demanded that the company should move out of Ogoni land without further delay. This further heightened the tension in Ogoni. All the elders that disagreed with Ken and his boys were described as, quote, vultures, while the elders described the youth as, quote, terrorists. It was such a toxic situation in Ogoni land. The once peaceful place had become a tensed environment. The stage was now set for violence, but it was not clear what form or dimension it was going to take. The military did not also see any good reason at the time to arrest any significant person. So, they continued in their patrol duties to maintain peace and order in Ogoni land. On 21st May 1994, the unexpected occurred. Some elders had gathered for a meeting in the palace of the paramount traditional ruler, Berimene of Gokana. While the meeting was ongoing, a large number of youths invaded the palace and murdered four of the chiefs in the most horrendous manner. Their bodies were cut into pieces, dragged out of the palace, and further cut into pieces. The youth had suspected them of gathering to share money which the youth said was gotten from Shell. There was however no verifiable evidence of such money being found in the palace. 
and the killing of the chiefs marked a terrible turning point in Ogoni land. The families of the Ogoni four did not take this lightly. It was unacceptable. From this moment on, Ogoni was not the same again. Had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, otherwise known as Opota Panel, which extended its sitting to Potakot, the man who served as commander of the Internal Security Task Force by name Colonel Okum Timor testified on oath as follows about the killing of the four chiefs. In his words, quote, On that fateful day, I went around Gyoku village for a rescue mission without success. The following day, May 22nd, the search continued until reliable information took us to the spot where the Ugoni four were butchered and roasted for consumption. It was me that picked the bits and pieces of the bones thrown away together which I brought to the government house in a bag for the military administrator's press briefing. End of quote. It was tragic, it was horrific, and indeed difficult to explain. It was not just a case of murder, it was murder in the most gruesome, inhuman, and most horrendous manner. In their petition to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the Opota panel, the families of the murdered Ogoni Four stated graphically as follows, quote, The deceased were at a well-publicized meeting at the palace of the Berimene Gokana at Kyoko. The purpose of the meeting was to plan for the reception of some of the sons and daughters of Gokana and not to share money, as Mosob later maliciously alleged. While they were at the meeting, some youths recognized as members of the National Youth Congress of Ogoni people, NYCOP, invaded the meeting venue, tortured and murdered them. The youths were over 1,000, and they used machete, knives, iron rods, clubs, and stones. Eyewitnesses saw and knew them by name. They were recognized as members of NYCOP, the youth wing of Mosul, who under the leadership of Sarowiwa had planned the massacre of what they described as vultures. In accordance with the modus operandi of NYCOP, the Ogoni four were butchered and what could not be was burnt to destroy the evidence. As a result, the families had nothing to bury. End of quote. This statement, as quoted, is found in the document titled, quote, Amended Petition Presented by the Families of Late Chief Edward Kobani, Mr. Albert Badi, Chief Samuel Urage, and Late Chief Theophilus Urage, dated 11th January 2001, and submitted to the Puta panel. See particularly pages 1, 2, and 4 of the amended petition. The petition was signed by Rose Kobani, Dora Badi, Elizabeth Orage, Evelyn Orage, Alaji Mohamed Kobani, and J.M. Kobani, all of them family members of the deceased Ogoni Four. This gruesome murder of Ogoni Four thus set the stage for the military to deal drastically and decisively with the situation in Ogoni. At that time, 1994, Nigeria was under military rule and General Sani Abacha was the military head of state. Abacha was extremely angry. The papers were awash with the gory pictures from Ogoni. Almost every newspaper in the country commented on the situation in the editorial columns. Recall that Abacha was Babangida's right-hand man and was there with Babangida when the military administration first opened its doors to Mosul for discussion of the Goni issues. Abacha became head of state shortly after the exit of Babangida. He was thus not a stranger to the Ogoni struggle. The civil disturbances in Ogoni was quite disturbing to the military but there was really not much for the military to use in making arrest of key actors in Ogoni at the time. The gruesome murder of the Ogoni Four thus presented a perfect springboard for the military. Immediate arrests were ordered by Abacha and carried out with dispatch. The military governor of River State at the time, Colonel Daudu Komo, addressed the world at a press conference held at the government house Port Harcourt. He displayed a bag containing the pieces of the remains of the Ogoni Four. These were pieces, bones, 
whipped by soldiers from the place where the Ogoni chiefs were murdered and dismembered. Several Ogoni youths were arrested in the wake of the murder. A panel was set up to investigate them. The panel then recommended Ken Sarawiwa, Ledun Miti, and eight others for trial for either direct involvement in the killing of the Ogoni four or for incitement to murder. Abata then constituted what he described as special court to try Ken and the rest. A civilian judge was appointed to head the court. His name is Justice Ibrahim Auta. He was a judge of the Federal High Court. He is now retired. Prosecutors were also appointed by the military to draft the charge and prosecute the accused persons. Barrister J.B. Daudu, who later served as the president of the Nigerian Bar Association, was in the prosecution team of the federal government. Others were also appointed to join in the prosecution. Trial took place in the city of Portacourt with the legendary legal icon Chief Gani Fawemi, S.A.N. and Femi Falano appearing for Ken Sarawiwa and the others except Ledun Miti, a lawyer who opted to defend himself in person. In the course of the trial, Gani Fawemi and Femi Falano withdrew their appearances citing abuse of procedure and absence of fair hearing and overwhelming presence of intimidation. The panel appointed other lawyers to appear for the accused persons. These new lawyers also withdrew their services in the course of trial. Trial went on and in the end, Ken Sarawiwa and eight others were found guilty of conspiracy and murder of the four Goni chiefs. They were sentenced to death by hanging. Only Ledun Miti escaped the death sentence by stroke of luck. Ledun Miti is still alive at the time of the making of this video. He has had a number of appointments into commissions of the federal government till today. The trial and sentence of Ken and Co. was heavily criticized as lacking the minimum particulars for justice and fair hearing. At the time of the pronouncement of the death sentence by the court, several African leaders and several others were at the Commonwealth Conference in Australia. On receiving the news of the sentence of Ken and Co., the leaders of the conference immediately appointed then-president of South Africa and respected statesman Nelson Mandela to lead a delegation to meet immediately with Abacha in Nigeria and plead for clemency for Ken and others. Several world leaders raised their voices and called for the suspension of the death sentence. They criticized the trial and insisted that Ken Sarawiwa and others should not be executed. But before Nelson Mandela could move to Nigeria, the news filtered in that Ken Sarawiwa and his eight Ogoni brothers had been executed by the hangman at the federal prisons in Port Harcourt, River State, on the orders of the military. Some reports say that their bodies were quickly dissolved in acid by the military. Others say that the bodies were buried in an unmarked grave. What is rather factual is that the bodies of the Ogoni Nine were not handed over to the families for burial. This marked the tragic end of the life and times of Kenule Bison Sarowiwa, most popularly known as Ken Sarowiwa and his eight compatriots from Ogoniland. For the family members of the four chiefs that were killed and their bodies dismembered, the trial, conviction, and execution of the Goni Nine was justice duly meted out. Several years after, President Olusha Gunobasanjo granted permission for the exhumation of what is believed to be the remains of Ken Sarawiwa and others for burial in their homes. The history of Ogoni land is indeed a deep history. In his book titled Witness to Justice, an insider's account of Nigeria's Truth Commission, published in 2011 by Bookcraft, Ibadan, Nigeria, particularly at page 153, the author, Reverend Father Matthew Hazan Kuka, now Bishop Matthew Hazan Kuka, has noted thus, quote, it is clear that although the military did bear some of the blame for its strong arm tactics in Ogoni land, the Ogonis themselves, especially Mosso, 
have to come to terms with the fact that they played very bad politics. End of quote. He went on to say, unquote, the saddest chapters in this struggle relates to the circumstances that led to the stillborn revolution, consuming not only its children, but also its founding fathers. The Ogoni story is indeed a sad story. It is a story of several years of marginalization and neglect by a multinational oil company in partnership with the Nigerian state. It is also a story of a people who rose up united to struggle for the recognition of their right as indigenous people of an oil-bearing community, only to end up against themselves, resulting in the gruesome killing of four of their chiefs, thereby setting the stage with their hands for the military and the Nigerian state to stand firmly on and deal more blows to the psyche and memory of Ogoniland. For us in back in history, it is our fervent prayer that the creator of mankind may grant eternal rest to the souls of the Ogoni 4 and Ogoni 9 and to restore peace, healing, compensation, development and succor to the people of Ogoni. Thanks for watching this edition of Back in History and do remember to subscribe to the channel or follow the page for regular notification on every new video. I remain your friend and host, Ekemini Udim.